Um, <clears throat> one thing to remember too is that the major airways, the conducting airways, the volume is really only like 150 cc's. So it doesn't take that much blood to essentially fill that up and cause asphyxiation and arrest. Um, so you have to be very mindful, even if somebody is technically like non-massive hemoptysis, if they have totally normal vital signs um, and they're just coughing up like a little bit of blood with each cough, they might at that point look like they have non-massive hemoptysis, but then um, rapidly deteriorate. And so the biggest thing is to use your judgment and make sure you're incorporating a lot of frequent reassessments of the patient. Um, okay. So there's a really broad differential for hemoptysis. Um, really one of the biggest things to differentiate this from is actually upper GI bleeding and epistaxis. So you have to make sure that you ask all the right questions and do everything on your physical exam to differentiate those things. Once you have narrowed it down to hemoptysis, then there's still a broad differential. Um, over the whole world, the most common cause is actually tuberculosis. But um, here, it's not really tuberculosis. Um, so there's cardiovascular causes like um, congestive heart failure, mitral stenosis, pulmonary hypertension, and AV malformation. Um, there's other infectious causes beyond just tuberculosis. So you have to think about bronchitis or pneumonia, um, a pulmonary abscess, um, parasitic infections, and fungal infections. Um, you have to think about structural or and pulmonary causes. So that would be something like um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis or PE with a lung infarction or um, bronchiectasis, which is sort of like a degeneration of the cartilage in um, chronic inflammatory conditions. Um, you also have to think about neoplastic causes of hemoptysis. So really besides tuberculosis, the biggest three causes of massive hemoptysis are bronchiectasis, lung cancer, and fungal infections. Um, if a patient has lung cancer, it's really only 3% of those people get massive hemoptysis. And if they do, they're probably going to have a sentinel bleed before then. So hopefully it would be caught and taken care of before they get to that point. Okay. So even beyond that, there's rheumatologic causes of hemoptysis. So um, you have to think about like good pasture syndrome, um, check the kidney function, uh, maybe they have lupus. Um, there's traumatic causes like a ruptured bronchus or um, a pulmonary contusion. There's iatrogenic causes, so any complication of any procedure like a biopsy or a chest tube, um, as well as uh, tracheoanominate fistulas from a, a patient in it with a trach. And then you have to think about other miscellaneous causes like cocaine. And uh, actually, endometriosis can give you hemoptysis if it goes with the menstrual cycle. Um, but one of the biggest things is that even once you go through this whole differential, it still can be like 30% of people that have like a cryptogenic cause of hemoptysis. And so we don't always know. And to be honest, I'm not sure that that really matters. If you think that somebody is having massive hemoptysis, it's not necessarily going to change your initial management of that patient. So what do we actually do? Um, first of all, if you have a patient who is technically like non-massive hemoptysis, they look totally stable, you're probably going to start with like a chest x-ray, you might do an infectious workup, you might do a malignancy workup, but if they're okay, chances are they can go home and just follow up with their primary doctor. If somebody has massive hemoptysis, this is very different because a lot of these patients wind up in the intensive care unit. Um, the biggest thing, remember, it's only 150 cc's of blood that can really fill up the airways. And so you want to focus on the airway essentially as soon as possible. So while somebody else is setting up the two large bore IVs and putting them on a monitor and getting blood, you should be setting up your airway kit. Um, along with this, I would include a crite kit just because these can be really difficult airways. Um, if you see any respiratory distress or any impending airway obstruction, you should be intubating as soon as possible. And particularly for these patients, you wanna use a very large endotracheal tube, like an eight or an eight and a half, because sometimes they wind up putting a bronchoscopy tube or something else through it. So it's important that the diameter can actually fit those things. 
Um, another thing to pay attention to is seeing if you can localize the bleeding. So if you know, for example, that somebody has lung cancer and they have a tumor, like a very large tumor in the left lung, they come in with massive hemoptysis, chances are maybe that's coming from the left lung. And so your goal, if the left lung is filling up with blood, you have to protect the right one. That's the empty one that has the clean airway. So if you think it's coming from the left, you can put the patient actually on their left lateral decubitus position to keep all that blood sort of like dependent and protect the, the functional lung as much as possible. Um, sometimes it's difficult to localize. Um, it can be seen on a chest x-ray sometimes, but it's not really that sensitive. If you think it's coming from both, you can try Trendelenburg, but really this is sort of like a last ditch effort. So along with that, you're gonna to wanna to correct any coagulopathies that you know that the patient has or might have. Um, you can consider like a red blood cell transfusion if it's very large volume. And then I would consider TXA. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end of this. Um, after that, you're gonna to wanna to image this patient and see where the bleeding is actually coming from. Um, a lot of the time that's done with a CT or an angiogram. Um, but if the patient is like too unstable to get over there, a lot of the time you'll do a bronchoscopy. You'll call your ICU or your, pul or your uh, pulmonary colleagues down to the CCT. They can do a flexible bron bronchoscopy at the bedside. Um, and that's actually good to try to localize some of the bleeding. The problem is it can't really suction out large volumes of blood and it can't get rid of a, a lot of blood clots. Um, to do that, a lot of the time, they actually have to do a rigid bronchoscopy, which is in the operating room. Um, so you're gonna to wanna to talk to your IR, your pulmonary and your CT surgery colleagues as soon as possible. If, you know, if your selective ventilation fails, if the bronchoscopy fails, those patients wind up going either to IR or to surgery. Okay, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about what's actually happening in the airway. Um, so A, in the top left, um, you can see that this is just an example of like a main stem left um, intubation. So um, usually if we just push the ET tube a little bit farther, it'll go to the right. The problem with that is if you see on the top of the, there's, I don't know if I can leave this, but in the top corner, like over here, if you push the ET tube into the right main stem and then you inflate the balloon, there's actually a chance that the balloon is gonna be like obstructing the ventilation of the upper lobe on the right side, because you'd be blocking that pathway that's going up. Um, it's just something to keep in mind if you're gonna try this. Um, B is a double lumen tube, which really we don't use. It's placed by anesthesia. The problem with this one is that it's not really wide enough to fit a bronchoscopy, so it's not really used. Um, C is showing an endotracheal tube that has a, like a bronchial blocker or a Fogarty balloon like pushed through it and blocking the, the left. Um, so this is good. Here you would be like selectively or preferentially ventilating the right side and then protecting the left, but that's not really gonna be doing much about the actual bleeding happening in the left lung. And then D um, shows a rigid bronchoscopy tube. This is kind of interesting because the bevel is sort of protecting the entire right uh, main stem. So you'd be selectively ventilating that side and then threading through any type of therapy through the bronchoscopy. Um, and again, you can push just like a balloon tamponade through that. Sometimes they do like an ice saline lavage or some kind of topical medication to try to get this under control. Okay. So just a little bit about bronchial artery embolization. Um, this can be a definitive therapy, but really it's hard to say because you might only see extravasation of contrast in like 15% of cases. Um, even if you don't see that though, you could still see an AVM or see like a, an aneurysm that would suggest that that's the cause of bleeding. Um, there is a syst systematic review of 22 studies. They found that the success rate of bronchial artery embolization was between 70 and 99%. So it does work. 
Um, but sometimes patients will get re-bleeding and that same systematic review was over half of patients. Um, and this image, sort of in the bottom left corner of the image, you can see um, flush. So this is a patient with an AVM in um, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. Okay, I just wanted to touch on the evidence for TXA, because I think this is kind of interesting. Um, TXA is an antifibrinolytic drug that essentially is for controlling bleeding. So we know it has a bunch of other indications, but it hasn't been well studied in hemoptysis. Partially that's because it's rare, and partially it's because unstable patients with hemoptysis, you're probably gonna do what you know, do something more immediate instead of trying something new. Um, so in my head, TXA is just the opposite of TPA. Um, TPA activates your plasminogen. So you're gonna lead to your breakdown of clots because you have plasma breaking down your um, clots. If you have TXA, you're inhibiting the formation of plasma. So you're essentially leaving your clots alone and you can stop the bleeding, hopefully. So there's two uh, major studies about TXA and hemoptysis. One is by WAND, it's a systematic review in December 2018. They, um, they actually took patients that were already admitted to a pulmonary ward specifically for hemoptysis, um, and they compared nebulized TXA three times a day with saline nebs. Um, they were, and they sort of looked at the, the likelihood of resolution of your hemoptysis and also the volume of blood. Unfortunately, they actually excluded massive hemoptysis from the study and they only included 47 patients, but they did see that the resolution of hemoptysis was 96% if they got the TXA, and that was compared to just half in the saline nebs, and that was statistically significant. Um, there were no other like statistically significant differences in mortality or in the 30-day re-bleeding, re although the TXA group did have less, just didn't make it to statistical significance. Um, so this study, it's small, and I'm not really sure about nebulized TXA. Um, this is one of the things, especially in these patients, is if the airway is the biggest problem, I wouldn't want to necessarily put something over their face that's gonna prevent you from doing something more definitive for the airway. Um, there's one other study by Bellum, that's from 2016, and they actually, um, they compared IV TXA with IV normal saline for hemoptysis. Oops. Um, so again, they excluded massive. They just did anybody who had less than 600 cc's of bleeding in 24 hours. Um, this one only had 66 patients, but they did see a statistically significant decrease in mortality, actually, and in um, the frequency of hemoptysis. So overall, I'm not sure that that should push us sort of in the direction of giving everybody a, a TXA. Um, I think if you're gonna do it, if you're that concerned, I would probably start with IV just because the nebulized, I wouldn't want you to delay the airway management just to try nebulized TXA. Um, so just overall, remember that massive hemoptysis is not like a set in stone definition. It's something that you have to reassess constantly and it's something that's up to you. Um, it has a broad differential. Um, I would think about TB, bronchiectasis, lung cancer. If you don't have those, then think about maybe a PE or an AVM or something else. Um, again, focus on the airway. Try to keep that bleeding lung down and protect the one that's uh, not bleeding as much as possible. Um, make sure you talk to all your colleagues as soon as possible. And then if you think it's really that bad, you can consider IV TXA as soon as possible. Okay. That's it. Thank you. That's very good. Really good. Thank you. Um, I just want to emphasize something that you did say there, because then I've had a few of these load the boat. It really is very frightening when you see it, and you want to get as much help as possible. You know, and Page everybody's stat anesthesia, pulmonary surgery, thoracic surgery, if you have it. But it is, I've had a couple bleed out on me, you know, drowning in their own blood, mm -hmm. you know, bleed. 
hypovolemia to have the HRN in your blood and it's very, very effective. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know how much they use to nebulize TXA? Yeah, so uh, the, I don't know, the question was how much did they use to nebulize TXA for the people at home? They used 500 uh, milligrams. Here it's, yeah, they used 500 milligrams and five um, cc's three times a day and just compared it to saline nebs. Mm -hmm. So the, the other patients you have to worry about are the patients on anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. So uh, dialysis patients on their own anticoagulants, DDAVP, aspirin, DDAVP, mm -hmm. the DOAX, and warfarin, um, you know, K-Centro, we had it in the next, mm -hmm. remember the reversal issues. Yep. So if, if a patient even has a, a little mm -hmm. hemophysis on a uh, oral anticoagulant, then I think should observe them quite a while, maybe if you need it. Okay, thank you. Oh. Um, so in the chat, Tahir says, in lower GI bleed, we get CTAs for localization. Do you know um, if you've come across any source advocating for a CTA versus CT with contrast? Um, so I, to be honest, I didn't. Um, I th what I was reading actually said CT with contrast, but I think it depends on your sort of clinical judgment as well, and your colleagues. Um, example, if you know like a patient has hereditary hemorrhagic to angiectasia, they're probably gonna need like an angiogram. They also might go to IR. So I would defer some of that to the ICU and to CT surgery and to IR. 